Antimatter. It sounds like something made up just for sci-fi books and movies, but it's very much real. We create and send huge quantities of antimatter particles through our accelerators at Fermilab to test the known laws of physics. But what if a particle could also be its own antiparticle? That's what we're talking about today on Even Bananas. Could a particle be its own antiparticle? What does that even have to do with neutrinos? First, we have to talk about what antimatter is. Is it something at the heart of some evil plan to destroy the world? Yes. Sorry, no. That's Professor Steve Biller, and I guess he's my guest for this episode. Steve is a professor of physics at the University of Oxford and works on the Snow Plus experiment. In 1928, Paul Dirac came up with an equation that brought together the two pillars of physics, quantum mechanics and special relativity. Uh, there's just one problem. It gave two solutions for energy. So this happens with a quadratic equation, like for example, x squared equals four. Uh, x can be two or minus two, both work. Well, Dirac's equation was quadratic in energy, so you could have a positive energy solution and a negative energy solution. So when this sort of thing happens in physics, we tend to just throw away the non-physical solution and keep going. But Dirac wondered whether the negative energy solution could have a physical interpretation, and that led him to postulate the existence of antiparticles. So nowadays, we don't think of antiparticles as having negative energy. We think of them as particles that have their fundamental properties reversed. And amazingly, a few years later in 1932, the antiparticle to the electron was discovered, the positron, which looks identically like an electron, but with a positive charge. If we know anything about neutrinos, we know that they're as weird as possible at every opportunity. It's kind of their thing. True to form, they might not fit into the particle-antiparticle pattern either. In fact, there's a possibility that neutrinos could be turned into their own antiparticles. Which isn't unheard of, photons are their own antiparticles. But this would be a first for massive particles, and one more reason that neutrinos are unique. Three important properties that distinguish one particle from another are mass, charge, and spin. One of the easiest ways to tell a particle from its antiparticle is by looking at its mass and charge. Got a particle with the same mass as the electron but positive charge? That's a positron. Of course, neutrinos don't have charge, so we can't use that to tell them apart from antineutrinos. What about spin? We often refer to particle helicities to refer to whether a particle spins clockwise or anticlockwise relative to its direction of motion. Neutrinos are particularly weird, and they all spin anticlockwise, whereas antineutrinos spin clockwise. As far as we can tell, this may be the only difference between them. If so, then maybe it's possible to flip an antineutrino into a neutrino, or vice versa. The ability to perform such a flip is directly dependent on the particle's mass. The more massive it is, the easier it is to flip around. Neutrinos are incredibly small in their mass. Uh, at least a million times smaller than that of the electron. But against all expectations of the standard model, the mass is not zero. So maybe it is possible to perform this flip. If this flipping were possible, it would mean neutrinos were a different type of particle, called a Majorana particle, named after the Italian physicist Ettore Majorana, who proposed them. No massive Majorana particle has ever been discovered, and neutrinos are the only particles we know that could be one. So why is this a big deal? There's a problem with the universe. When it was created, you must have had equal amounts of matter and antimatter because you started from nothing, so it should all still add up to nothing. But if that's the case, it should have all annihilated with itself and there should be nothing left. So fortunately for us, something must have happened to prevent this from, from occurring. Somehow a small amount of antimatter must have flipped over into matter. So maybe neutrinos hold the key to understanding how this happened. But how do you test for this flipping? The only practical way we know is to look for an extremely rare process called neutrinoless double beta decay. To understand that, let's take two steps back to normal beta decay. It's a radioactive decay that happens a lot in nature, 
where a neutron in an atomic nucleus decays into a proton, an electron, and an electron antineutrino. Long-time fans of this show will remember that this is why bananas produce neutrinos. In double beta decay, two neutrons do this simultaneously. So you get two protons, two electrons, and two antineutrinos. This is a process predicted by Maria goppert meyer And it's incredibly rare, but it does happen in certain isotopes. It's been measured. If one of those antineutrinos were to flip around and become a neutrino, it could then effectively cancel out the other antineutrino, as matter and antimatter tends to do. That would give us neutrinoless double beta decay, where we get two electrons and no neutrinos. If we see this happening, then we'll know with confidence that we observed Majorana particles. What we're looking for in our experiments are decays where all of the energy goes into the two electrons with none of it disappearing into the antineutrinos. The experiments use radioactive isotopes that are known to undergo double beta decay, like tellurium-130 or xenon-136 or germanium-76. But it's a really tough game because if this happens at all, it's ridiculously rare. And we're trying to distinguish it from all the other decays that are happening all the time. Some experiments like SNOW Plus use large detector volumes uh, to try to maximize the number of decays that they see. Whereas others like LEGEND or NEXO or CUPID will have smaller detector volumes, but better energy resolution to try to distinguish them clearly uh, from normal decays. LEGEND combines the expertise from two previous experiments, Gerda and Majorana. The Majorana demonstrator was located at Sanford Underground Research Facility, right down the tunnel from the new home of the Fermilab hosted experiment, June. So why are we so excited about this? Well, you've heard me say before that neutrinos could explain the matter-antimatter imbalance in our universe. The bit you might not have heard is that it only works if neutrinos are Majorana particles. Measuring neutrinoless double beta decay could also give us information about the neutrino mass and well, particle physicists would be really excited because it's a whole new kind of particle and that's the kind of thing we love. Complicating this is the fact that we don't in fact know what the actual value of neutrino mass is, which plays a crucial part of the flipping probability. Depending on what this value is, a discovery might be right around the corner or it could be several years before we know the answer. But neutrinos have revolutionized our ideas of physics many times, so maybe they could do this again. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks, Steve. Bye, Kirsty. There are a lot of mysteries in the neutrino world, and we're just getting into them. Like, share, and subscribe to come along, and let me know in the comments, what do you think is the most interesting neutrino conundrum? Fun fact. Italian physicist Ettore Majorana, who worked on neutrino masses, famously disappeared in 1938. Enrico Fermi once said, there are several categories of scientists in the world. Those of second or third rank do their best, but never get very far. Then there is the first rank, those who make important discoveries fundamental to scientific progress. But then there are the geniuses, like Galilei and Newton. Majorana was one of these.